um, to our final speaker of the day. Um, we have uh, Tim Milne um, from Artomatic, and, and Tim is actually um, talking about um, effectively something that's very close to my heart. I, I talk a lot about content marketing in the digital world, because we do. And one thing with content uh, is, is telling a story, whether that's a story about you or your brand or your products or services. And how you tell that story can actually make the difference to whether you get a client or not. And I think Tim is actually going to talk to us about how to tell a better story. Absolutely. Tim Mill. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, Gordon, the previous speaker, speaker said that uh, he was the only person standing between you and the bar. Well, that is actually not true at all, and, and the idea of telling things that suddenly become not true is obviously very fashionable at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> so I'll apologise for, uh, for getting in the way of uh, that rather unfortunate story. Right, I'm going to talk to you about physicality, and I'm going to... What I need you to bear in mind when I'm talking about this is that it's going to hopefully be revolutionary and also blindingly obvious at the same time. And the reasons for that will probably become clear. But um, let's go back in history. Does anybody know who this is? Anybody? Hmm. Right, well, I thought you were supposed to be in the printing industry. Right, this is Thomas Gutenberg, who, in, who invented movable type and the modern printing press. But, crucially, Thomas Gutenberg wasn't a printer because printing didn't exist when Thomas Gutenberg was around. He was an entrepreneur and an engineer, and he exploited the local technology available to him in West Germany to, to create modern punches and thus movable type. And he wasn't interested in printing because printing, printing didn't, didn't exist. He was interested in how he could aid the distribution of information. Now, had he had different technology available to him, he'd have probably invented the internet. But <clears throat> obviously, he was 550 years <laughs> ahead of a better solution. And it's, you know, I think it's one of the incredible testimonies to the printing industry that it's taken that long to come up with a better way of doing what printing did. And for pretty much all of that time, the primary role of printing has been to distribute information. It's a medium. It's a way of transporting, just like the truck does, transporting information from one place to another place. The physicality of the printing, the paper, the, the binding, the ink, the mechanization, all of that has been incidental because really what mattered was the information itself. And the printing was just a convenient way a convenient medieval way of facilitating that. And obviously, we've, got, we've now got better ways of doing that. Now, what, what Gutenberg did was he dramatically reduced the price of information. Prior to Gutenberg, in fact, in the early part of the 15th century, the, a, a book cost about the same as a small farm. So in the Cambridge Library in 1422, they had a couple of hundred books, and they were guarded very jealously. And so you could, and that was representative of almost all the books that were available at that time. And so obviously the printing press came along and the price of information dramatically dropped. But now we live in an age where information has arguably reached its, you know, has reached its ultimate price, which is free. This is American writer Stuart Brand who coined the phrase, information wants to be free at, a, at the Hackers Conference in California in 1984. And what he was talking about was a sort of paradox that information, the, the value of information comes from its lack of value. So really the value of information is about its, our access to it, how easily we can get it and what it, what it can do for us. And really the only way that that value can be really be maximised is, is <clears throat> through its free and easy distribution. And we know all of this now. You know, we, we freely use apps that give us information that we're, we're happy to use, but we don't want to pay for. With the, now, the consequence of this huge explosion of information is there's obviously an enormous amount of it. This statistic, which is the amount of information a con, the average American consumer is exposed to in, in a day, is for actually from 2008, 2009. It's probably doubled or tripled since then. So, it's a, you know, you drop the price of something or reduce the price of nothing, and obviously the supply of it goes through the roof. But the one thing that hasn't gone through the roof 
since Gutenberg's time and since every other time is the number of hours in a day. So we still, so the number of hours in a day is fixed. Relative to the amount of information, it's be become exceedingly scarce. Now here's an interesting statistic. I don't know if you can read that. So the odds of being struck by lightning are 0.3%. The odds of uh, someone clicking on your banner ad are 0.04%. So that tells you a lot about how precious attention has become. You have a huge glut of information, you throw it at people who've got very little attention, and not very much happens. Now, the, you know, what the web marketing and the digital agencies have done very cleverly, since people stopped clicking on banner ads, they're saying, oh, no, no, it's not about clicking anymore. The, th the banner ads are the billboard of the internet. It's just about awareness. Yeah, sure. So this brings us to a very important point, which is now we've got this technology, is there any value? What's the value of the medieval technology? Now, I would spin this around another way, and I would say, what can this tell us about this? So if we go back to that idea of transportation, and the fact that digital distribution does it so much better, then really what we're left with is just the, the physicality of the book. So I want you to start thinking about print not as an information distribution medium, not about the words and pictures that are written on it, and start thinking about it as a physical object. Because that physical object has some huge value and some huge relevance. And just to, if you're struggling with that idea, then think about something that's not an object, which is the internet. So if you want to think about, try and, if you were to in, describe the internet to a small child, what, how would you describe it? Because it doesn't fit any of the rules of being an object. It's not, it's not self-contained, it's not defined, it doesn't, it doesn't begin and end, it's just an amorphous mass of never-ending networked code. It's absolutely unfamiliar to us. And this is the first thing to understand about all printed objects, is they're very much like us. They exist in physical space. I exist in physical space. The book exists in physical space. It's defined by distinct boundaries that say where it begins and where it ends. And this is all very familiar to us. We see a, a little bit of ourselves in these objects. And the reason we do this is because this is a language that we learn. Now, I'm sure you know, a lot of you in this room have got small children or their children were small at one time. And one of the things you'll notice about the human infant was about three or four months old. They start stuffing anything that they can lay their hands on in their mouths. And, and you know, soppy parents think, oh, he's teething or he's hungry or stuff like that. There's nothing to do with that. What they're doing, they're picking up anything that they can grab, and they do it at three months because they develop the motor skills sufficient to do it. And they put the things in their mouth because they've got more nerve endings in their mouth than anywhere else. And what they're doing is they're exploring the world and they're, they're learning a really, really important con concept. In fact, it's the very first concept that we ever learn, which is the world is made of distinct, separate, self-contained entities. And that the world is actually... The, these physical self-contained entities are separate and distinct from the human. And this is the kind of building blocks of the self. It's very important for human beings to understand that they begin and end within their own physical restrictions. And they learn that because they, they, they see other things that are defined by physical restrictions. And this, this idea that the world is made of self-contained separate entities then informs all of our thinking. So think about how often you use the word thing. And we quite often use the word thing and we use it to, to wrap artificial boundaries around rather amorphous ideas or abstract concepts that we're struggling to actually def to define. In order to define them in our own mind, we have to turn them into a thing. We have to put boundaries around them. Really what we're doing is referencing an object. Now, the grey matter that sits between your ears has evolved, as you know, Rory pointed out earlier, has evolved over millions of years consists of a largely unconscious bit, which operates most of the things that you do on a day-to-day -day level, and a very small conscious bit. And that largely unconscious bit we share with our Stone Age ancestors, and it evolved entirely in a physical environment, an environment that consists of environments and objects and people. All of these things are, are physical things, and the human brain is just naturally attuned through evolution 
and through our own personal experience to physicality. It couldn't be, it couldn't be anything else. But suddenly, within the last generation, we're now presenting ourselves and interacting with media and devices that present a whole world to us that doesn't exist. Now, you might spend you know, several hours on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever it is, quite probably not realizing that these entities that you're interacting with, they don't exist. They're just made of code and numbers. They're not, they're not existent objects. And when we start to think about the, the internet, if we start to actually think about what it actually really is, has anyone got any idea what it is? We know it's probably some servers like this out in California somewhere. It's probably some wires. You know, George Bush famously said he thought it was all pipes. Um, <clears throat> we don't really know what it is. You know, we don't really know how it works. You know, it's probably light beams and photons and things traveling down wires. But the moment we start to think about it, the kind of our idea and understanding of it kind of collapses. And this has been a big problem for all the kind of people in the tech sector whose job it was to sell us something that we couldn't really understand. Now, one very effective way that they've done that is to just simply borrow physical language. So all the iconography and all the symbols around sending an email is an envelope, because we understand what an envelope is, we understand what it does, and we're happy to adopt language around it, like the use, use the word send. So when you say to your friends, oh, I'll send you an email, you're not really sending it at all. You're duplicating the code on your computer, you're turning that into binary language, which is transmitted at the speed of light to be simultaneously replicated on somebody else's device. Now, that would be a bit of a mouthful. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier for the technology people to just adopt and co-opt all of this physical language because they know that we understand it. And Steve Jobs, who, who you know, who's a visionary in this field, when the first computers that they made, and, you know, the sort of now famous fallout he had with Steve Wozniak was because Wozniak was a coder, he was a hacker, and he, you know, he wanted people to sort of buy their computers and take them apart and, and, and rebuild them because that's what he enjoyed doing. And Jobs said, no, we're going to make sealed boxes because we don't want people taking them apart. Because what Steve Jobs knew was that computers had to have an appeal beyond computer hackers. And that what Steve Jobs did in creating Macintosh, the whole idea of Macintosh was black type on white, on white background, so it looks like paper. And that was, a revolution in, that was a revolution in computer terms. But the difference between that and that, that's a real envelope. Now, a real envelope, a physical envelope, one of the distinctions between that and that is a real envelope can only exist in one place at the same time. Now, unless you're sort of, you know, unless, unless you're uh, um, a quantum physicist where, you know, on a day to day basis things can exist in two places at the same time, most of us who live in the physical world, they can't. An envelope goes from one place to another place. It can't simultaneously exist in one place and then exist in another place. That's, that's the world of physicality, that's the way it works. Now, what would be the value of this? Well, you know, Rory, who, who you heard earlier, talks a, a lot about behavioral economics. And in behavioral economics, there's a thing that happens in our minds called loss aversion. Now, loss aversion is a, a sadness or a feeling of regret or a fear of possible feeling and regret we might feel when we don't have something. So when we give a physical thing from one person to another person, one person acquires the thing, so he gets to receive it. Now, we don't have much hardwiring around acquisition. and We don't have much hardwiring around about getting things. We have a lot more hardwiring, hardwired response about losing things. And one of the things that we know is that when we send something to someone else, we're going to lose it. But this person all, also knows that they lost it. So they might not have an affinity for acquisition, but they've got a strong affinity to loss. And they know that that person has given this thing up. Now, in Rory's talk, he talked a lot about unnecessary expense and the value of creating print that's expensive so that it looks as if you spent time or energy or resources on, on producing the thing that, that the other person produced the thing that you have received. And the reason why you acknowledge that value is because you're acknowledging their loss. 
Now, a lot of these theories are written in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Has anybody read this book? OK. Um, I would heartily suggest that all of you rush it down to Smith and buy it. I'm sure it's on special offer now, because they've sold millions of them. But it's, it's a very, very enlightening book. The basic premise of it is that our brain has got two systems, and which Kahneman rather imaginatively calls System 1 and System 2. System 1 is your primitive, intuitive, fast intelligence, and System 2 is your slow, intellectual, cognitive intelligence. We all think we're System 2 thinkers, but the reality is that we're not. Most of the System 1 thinking, the primitive, sometimes called reptilian thinking, which we share with much larger animal groups, one of its key distinctive features is it's very, very fast. And this is the, the rather um, affectionately known death adder. And what the death adder can do, it can go from that pose, which is its resting pose, to the biting you pose, which really, really hurts, and then back to that in that space of time. Now imagine what sort of brain functionality it must take to control that movement it's incredibly fast. And all primitive decision-making, all unconscious um, system one decision-making is all very fast. And a lot of the time, the, the, we don't think about things. And we don't think about things because it was evolutionarily valuable for us to not think about it. So if you think of our Stone Age ancestors who might have wandered into a cave, into a dark cave, and they hear a noise, if they sort of sit, if they think about it consciously and think, oh, I wonder if that noise is a bear, or if it is a bear, maybe I should get out of here. By that time, the bear's already halfway through their leg. So it's, it was evolutionarily important to develop a, a whole set of reflexes and, and mental processes that are fantastically fast. So we wander into the cave, we hear a funny noise, and we're out. And we need to get out very quickly and react very quickly. The advantage of speed in this situation is that the subconscious part of our brain, the system part, one part of our brain, when it encounters something unfamiliar, it's the first thing that gets there. This is a race. This is a winner-take-all winner race. So when you encounter something new, you're going to encounter that your intuitive side of your brain is going to get there first, and it is going to get to decide what that thing is and how you feel about it, and probably what your subsequent actions are. So how does this relate to what, to what we're talking about generally? Well, here's a couple of examples. Um, in print, you know, there's the physical thing, and there's, there's the words and pictures bit. Now, you know, since Gutenberg, we've all, we all think that the, the words and pictures bit is the important bit, and we've always basically disregarded this bit. And quite a few people have talked today about how marketing people, you know, all they want to, all they want to do is get the cost down. And that, the, usually the way to get the cost down is to, they accept that that's fixed and they just want to print it on thinner paper and make it less, you know, make it physically cost less. And they're unaware that our subconscious minds who arrive at this encounter first, they, they encounter the physical thing first, because that's how, that's how the unconscious brain is tuned. Our primitive brain is tuned physically. It doesn't look at this, it looks at that. It picks it up in our hand and it gets a feeling for it. And then how that feels dictates how we feel about that. If this is nice and pleasurable and feels valuable and feels like there's some effort and endeavor and, and, and enterprise within this, we might feel very favorably to the content. If it's sort of cheap and flimsy and nasty, all the signaling that goes on is that this is the person creating it didn't really put any value into it. And so therefore, we've, that changes our mind significantly about how we interpret the information that's printed on it. And here's a good example. Right, this is a San Bernardino Police Department in California. Uh, uh, for those of you who've traveled in the US, I'm sure you're quite familiar that um, homeless people tend to um, stand around at the bottom of freeway ramps because the, the cars stop and they can get money and they often hold cardboard signs up. So the police department decided to go out one afternoon, they, they put on casual clothing, but not overly scruffy clothing, and they held up signs that quite clearly explain, in words, I'm not a homeless person, I'm from the San Bernardino Police Department, and I'm looking for seatbelt and cell phone violations. The driver's coming down the ramp, they see someone standing at the bottom at the bottom of the freeway ramp, holding a cardboard sign, 
And because, as Rory pointed out, the human brain is all about context. It sees the physical signal first, and the intuitive side of its brain says, well, that's a homeless person with a cardboard sign. I'm not going to bother, read I'm not gonna bother reading what it says, because I know it's just going to say, you know, I was a Vietnam vet, and can I have some money, please? Well, the net result of this is that they stood out there one afternoon for two hours, and they wrote 53 tickets, because people didn't bother reading the signs. Now another, and then another sort of more close to home thing is, there is all the stuff that piles up on your doormat. Now I'm, I'm going to say quite a controversial thing. I know there are people in the direct mail side of the industry and I know that the term junk mail is quite often interpreted as being a failure of targeting. That, that the idea of junk mail is unwanted mail. It's, it's mail that's not relevant to us. Well, I would counter that and I would... I would challenge anyone to actually think about their behaviour around this stuff, if that were true, if it were true it was about targeting, then everybody would dutifully walk down their hallway, they'd pick up all this stuff off the doormat, they'd carefully read it all, and they'd go, no, I don't want a new kitchen, I'm not hungry, I don't want a kitchen, I don't want an extension, I don't want some glasses, I don't, I don't want all of these things. They do, they don't. Their intuitive mind, which comes at the encounter first, takes one look at the physicality of all this brightly coloured, cheap, thin paper sitting on the doormat and says it's junk. And then the next decision that the intuitive mind tells the conscious mind to do, which is, I'm not going to bother reading this. So therefore, then the next action is to toss it in the bin. So all of the work that went into creating all of this fantastic design, the creativity, the photography, the endless retouching, all the client meetings, all the kind of strategy stuff that all went into the origination is completely in the bin because the recipient didn't get any further than the, interpret than the interpretation to say, this is junk, I'm not going to read it. And that's entirely down to the physical nature of it. The physicality of that signals, this is junk. Now, if you doubt any of this, I would... Um, could we turn the sound up? substance. And what we expect to happen is that that simple experience with a warm substance or a cold substance will prime people to sort of activate these... Uh, feelings of warmth and comfort and the things that we learned about since we were very young. And when we have those things in mind, those things we know will color people's judgments and decisions and their behaviors as well. Volunteers for the experiment are asked to hold a warm cup of coffee as they are met by Lawrence. They have been primed with heat. The purpose of the experiment is to record participants' judgments about Lawrence's colleague, Randy. How was your record? It was awesome. Well, it's good. That's how I got stranded in Florida. Well, because of the snowstorm oh. in New York on Friday, so I got stranded. The theory is that the hot drink will somehow elicit positive feelings towards Randy, even several minutes after experiencing the warmth of the cup. And here's the killer question. Would you give Randy a permanent job? Based on your brief interaction with Randy, or would you hire him um, as part of nature? Uh, he seemed like a, a generally friendly guy. Um, so, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, why not? <laughs> sure, yes. Yes. Saying warm and friendly things about a stranger might just be the normal polite response. Time to cool things down. Except for the temperature of the drink, identical conditions, the same conversation with Randy. How was the great? Exactly that. Nothing. <laughs> and six minutes later, the same questions from Lawrence. Based on your brief interaction with him, would you recommend him or would you hire Randy as project manager? Uh, as a leader, I'm not sure. Based on the brief interaction. The experiment shows, remarkably, that a brief encounter with a beverage could see you either hired or fired. It's a powerful effect, and one that might have worrying applications. In the case of, say, uh, consumer products, um, feeling warm about a product presumably will make you more likely to buy it. Now, 
I'm sure none of us would want to actually admit, certainly to our friends or probably to ourselves, that we could be influenced on decisions like this by something as seemingly kind of removed as whether a drink that we had in a lift on the way to an interview was hot or cold. But this film and numerous other experiments like this demonstrate that the, the, the physical interactions can, can have very powerful effects on us because they tap so deeply into our unconscious. And the reason they tap so deeply into our unconscious is because our unconscious minds and our brains are f physically attuned. We understand physical language, we get it and we respond to its signals and, and, it, and it affects and alters how we behave on a sort of minutely basis. And, you know, the organ sitting in between your ears has not changed biologically at all in at least 40,000 years. There is no, you know, if you gave a Stone Age, a Stone Age man a cell phone, in a couple of days he'd figure it out. There's nothing peculiar about our brains. The only reason why we can adapt to this technology is through the brain's supreme plasticity. But in biological terms, it's exactly the same. All of us have got a Stone Age brain between our ears. Now, some quite interesting things happen when a Stone Age brain encounters 21st century technology. Now, if you think about your Stone Age ancestors, the limit of their world was their horizon. That was as far as they could see. As far as they could see what was happening right now was the horizon. That was the, that was the extent. Anything that was beyond the horizon was in their future. Now, neuroscientists, people like Daniel Wolpert, have uh, maintained that the human brain is entirely future-focused. It's all about making predictions. All we do all day long is make predictions about what, and predictions and anticipation about what we think is going to happen. And that means that our intuitive minds are absolutely focused on the horizon because that's where the future was going to come from. That's where the new opportunities, that's where the new threats, that's where the new things, the new events would all appear over the horizon. And our Stone Age ancestors who shared this brain with us, they all knew that there was more beyond the horizon. They didn't know how much more. They, might, they probably had no understanding of what was there. But they knew that something was around it. So they were always focused on the horizon. Now, if you put a cell phone into the, into the hands of someone with a Stone Age brain that's focused on the horizon, what happens? Well, this is Washington, D.C., where they've had to segregate the sidewalks to people who are texting on cell phones and people who are not. And the reason they do this is because this is what happens when a Stone Age brain gets confronted with 21st century technology. Because the phone in the hand, that's the whole world in your hand. There is no horizon anymore. You can find out anything. Anything that you would ever want to know about your friends, the world, anything that's going on, the whole world is in your hands. So to a, to a curious Stone Age brain who's, been, who's really adapted and evolved to just having a horizon, this is, like, this is like all manna from heaven. No wonder people walk into lampposts. No wonder people get absolutely fixated. And what I think is very interesting is that when we see this and other behaviours around technology, especially when they become very unusual and we tend to, we, you know, we become very dismissive of them and we, we, you know, we moan about our teenage children be, being fixated on, a, on their phones while we're secretly texting somebody under the t dinner table. You know, we all do it and they're not doing it because they're teenagers, they're doing it because they've, we've all got this brain. And when presented with a limitless horizon, you know, it can't do but be, be absolutely obsessed by it. Now, inside our heads, obviously, you know that the brain is divided into two, and you have a left side and a right side, and neuroscientists have, have you know, long dismissed the idea that all one type of th thinking happens in one side and another type of thinking happens in another side. But this chap, Professor Ian McGilchrist, who is a sort of neuroscientist slash philosopher slash classical scholar, he's, he wrote a fantastic book called The Master and His Servant, and he describes, he describes the brain as being split into two, but through functionality rather than physically separated. And what neuroscientists have discovered is that most of the things that go on in the brain, they are separated into these two dividing types, but they happen in both sides. But the, the division between the left and right brain is very distinctive. 
The left brain is narrow, focused, familiar, and disembodied. This is what you use when you're focusing on tasks. This is what you use when you're concentrating on something. This is what you use when you're conscious. When you're talking, you're, you know, the language is mostly a conscious act. It's what we, this is what we think we are. The right brain, what Kahneman called the system one, the fast bit, is sustained, broad, vigilant, alert, contextual, embodied, imprecise, unfamiliar, uncertain, implicit, individual, interconnected, incarnate, imperfect, evolving, and essentially living. This is, this is the bit that we experience the world with. So if that's a narrow beam of focus, this is like a radar that sweeps the world continually, and it's constantly looking for things. This is fast, this is slow. That's largely unconscious, and that's largely conscious. Now, the Gilchrist <coughs> assertion is that, there's a sub, there's, that these two are subordinate. There's a hierarchy going on in these things because the fast bit, that's the bit that sees the world and that's the bit that gets to see everything first and that's the bit that gets to make the decisions and that's the bit that decides what that bit pays attention to. Exactly as we see with the junk mail on the doormat. Our right brain sees cheap, scrappy paper tells our left brain, don't bother reading it. That's the, end of the, that's the end of the interaction. Now, what's very interesting is that, and this is McGilchrist's assertion as well, is that we've, we're entering into sort of dangerous times. In the last 500 years, actually since, since the invention of printing from Gutenberg, and really fueled by the Enlightenment, as we can see here, and all the kind of Western civilization, we have come to believe that we are conscious thinking animals. We've come to disregard our unconscious. And in fact, even if I, I, it always makes me laugh. Whenever I use the word intuition, I can sort of see people wincing. Because they think intuition is something that belongs in sort of Glastonbury crystal shops. And it's sort of people who, you know, people who go to sort of, um, who live in teepees and things like that. There's a sort of, people don't want to think about us as intuitive animals. We want to think of ourselves as cold, logical, rational, predictive kind of animals. And that is a product of Western thinking. It's, it's the advancement of logic and reason has led us to believe that we are these conscious animals. And the thing about a conscious aware is a, a consciousness culture or a belief in rationale and rational thinking is that it's unaware of that. It, you know, Rory's point and all the behavioral, behavioral economists' point is that this, is, this isn't controlling this any less than it ever did. This is always in control. It's just this bit doesn't realize it's in control. And that's quite an interesting and possibly quite dangerous, dangerous idea. So it might be as, the, as we get, you know, as we get more of this, we get more involved in technology, the technology gets more involved in our lives, gets gets faster, gets <coughs> more interactive, you know, we're going to be thinking less because our natural human response to a large amount of fast information is to think less, is to rely on these more primitive mechanisms, these more reptilian mechanisms. And it might be that we'll think about these things less. And it might be that, you know, more technology means more faster thinking. And it used to be, you know, when newspapers wanted to were created, the proprietors of newspapers went to graphic designers and graphic designers created newspapers. You know, they would, there would be a layout and a hierarchy and they would make it all look nice, they'd pick the typeface. But nowadays, website owners and e-commerce owners are increasingly employing, employing behavioral scientists to try and second guess the intuitive brains and the subconscious mechanics of human beings because what they realize is that when people encounter websites and technology, they're not thinking and they just go to whatever, you know, whatever they feel like, and they've got very short attention spans. Graphic designers can't deal with this. It's beyond their scope. So the behavioral economists and behavioral scientists are earning a lot of money inside e-commerce firms telling them how to design their web pages for better interaction. And for the newspapers themselves, they're also evolving in this world. You know, obviously, they have the, you know, we all know that they've got the well-publicized struggles with how to make themselves work online, but certain, certain aspects of the newspaper sector are very vibrant. You know, the weekend newspapers. Weekend newspapers with lots of different, you know, lots of different sections that you throw out on the kitchen table on a Saturday morning. 
they're really about, you know, they're about behavior. They're about s signifying to your friends and family that this is a weekend. I'm not working, this is a weekend. And they're, 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 <coughs> they're making us behave in a certain way. Well, I'll, I'll speed through quite quickly. I'm getting the Les Dawson. Um, physicality is comforting. And that's very important to us. The reason why e-book sales are declining, physical book sales are relying is because people want to be surrounded by physical books. They get comfort from this. So what's the value of this? How can we think about this value? So very quickly, I would take you back to the middle, of the middle part of the 19th century. And prior to that, painters were just sort of rather functionary people whose job it was to reproduce the world in the way that it was. Their job was to deal in visual information which they represented accurately, and nobody really took painters very seriously. Painting wasn't really part of culture. In the 1840s, they invented the camera, and people got an accurate representation of the world exactly as it was, and everyone said, well, oh, brilliant, that's the end of painting. We don't need that anymore. Suzanne and his chums thought, fantastic, now they've invented the camera. We don't have to paint the world as it is. We can paint the world that, as we feel about it. It's about human emotional experience. And painting became... In, you know, became enormously value. In a single generation, people started queuing up and going to exhibitions, and painting became the, the high point of culture. And people like Malevich and other people of the early part of the 20th century reduced painting down in, and started to separate out its physicality. They started to simplify the paintings out into things that were much more, they were as much sculptures as they were paintings. And if we take this back to its ultimate replication, we have things like Andrus Gursky. This is, a, this is a print from a really dull photograph on a gloomy day of the Rhine with all the landscape features photoshopped out. And it was done in an edition of 20. It's quite big. It's very, very big. But it sold for $4.3 million. And value around objects is really the thing that is driving the art world. Now, we all know who Martin Sorrell. And Martin Sorrell, who's been a you know, big advocate of digital, has suddenly did a sort of huge U-turn on this and decided that there is an argument at the moment going on about the effectiveness of newspapers and magazines, even in their traditional form, and maybe they're more effective than people give them credit for. You know, what Sorrell has realized, along with all the other people in the heads of the agency industry, is that they should abandon print at their peril. And the reason why they're realizing this is that they're coming face to face with the realities of running digital campaigns. When agencies run digital campaigns, what they have to do is hire armies of teenagers to sit there and tweet about cakes and consumer goods and stuff like that. If you're on the Sainsbury's account, you know, the media agency, and you're running the Sainsbury's Twitter account, you've, you know, you've got, your job is to sit down and come up with you know, tweets about two-for-one offers or something. And not only is it mind-numbingly boring that, everybody, that nobody ever reads, it's also incredibly expensive to run. It's very difficult for the agencies to make any money out of it. And this is one of my kind of central points about print. In print, we make physical things. With physical things, we add value. We take raw materials, we add processes, and we add value to them. And therefore, we can make money out of it. People are very happy to pay for things that sit in boxes on pallets, because they understand the value. There's value there. There's not a lot of value in, in an army of teenagers tweeting, because that's what they do anyway. So, just to, su just to sum up, what we need to think, if we're going to start thinking about print in a physical world, we need to start thinking about it very differently. This isn't a book as a representation of information, it's an object. Information is going to, get, going to sit somewhere else. Information will sit where it belongs, which is on the internet. This is where all the information lives, and that really, really is what our modern day library is. And our modern day libraries that are phys phys full of physical books are actually going to really become museums. So I would ask you to ask yourself, do you like printing? Yes, you do like printing. Are we a big fan of it? Yes, we are. And we should, we should go on and celebrate its physicalness because that's where its future value lies, nowhere else. Thank you very much.